let's turn the mill on, shall we? First of all, we have to lift the upper or runner stone. That reduces the drag on the mill. And then if we turn the wheel here, it lifts the water wheel sluice and allows the water to go on the wheel. And the more you have that time. It's like it accelerates on the car. Now that's too, that's too far. What it's going to do is set it to the right milling. But now it's got your, your stone to the right milling height. And then, set the thread speed to the mill. Too far, it's right there. Thank you. 
because it makes the most noise in the mirror. It's going to be down where this press probably. But there again, you can, adjust, you can, adjust, you can adjust the, the flow of the grain by adjusting this cord here. See, we've more or less cut it off. If you tension it, there you can let more on. Again, you've got to set this just right. So then it goes, drops down in between the two. Drops down to what's called the eye. Obviously, the, a lot of the milling was done here, and in fact, all, almost all of it 
subtle is why villagers would bother to come from their homes in which they could have had their own personal quern and come and mill here. Why did they do that? In the medieval times, Lord of the Manor probably owned the mill. He sublet the mill to a miller and his family ran it, but he would be getting the profit from milling, so he discouraged the hand querns. Some of them were even taken away and um, broken. So the people were forced then to bring the grain to the mill to be milled. So it was a monopoly of the A monopoly, money. yes. Well, that, that is, explains one of the great puzzles in the history of milling, because obviously they had all over the world, they wanted to mill things. But in the rest of the world, in Roman times and in China and Japan, India and so on, they would use hand querns in their homes, and particularly the women would spend hours and hours milling. Yes. So what made one of the things that made the West different was the manorial system, which put a monopoly on milling and gave it to one person, the Lord of the Manor, or, That's right. or also the ecclesiastical monasteries, which were often uh, also had mills on the edge of streams. And they would try and take the profit. So it was the beginning of the sense of capitalism as well as industrial civilization. Because That's right. It's concentrating capital into a building, which one person has a monopoly then to do the milling. That's true. Mm, extraordinary, because to construct something like this would be very expensive, wouldn't it? I mean, if you go to a, an Indian village or a Chinese village in the past, you'd never find a huge building like this, full of machinery, full of complicated craft work, producing a product, which is really what industrialization is. So the, in that sense, the concentration of capital and skills in a place like this, so that one person can make a profit, the Lord of the Manor or yes. the ecclesiastical authorities, is quite extraordinary, and it's giving them monopoly, isn't it? Oh, yes. And the wood might have come from the state of the Lord of the Manor. His carpenters, his uh, labourers might have built it. Mm. So it's probably something that uh, an ordinary person couldn't afford to do. Mm. But of course, then he was anxious then to make sure that all the grain was, was milled in his mill to get mm. his profit. Mm. So you were saying, David, that in fact the Lord of the Manor's craftsman would make the wood and make a mill like this. And this leads to one of the extraordinary effects of having a huge building like this. For instance, in the Doomsday Book, England had something like five and a half thousand mills, water mills. There were only 3,000 communities, so that means that each, on average, of course they were placed in different places, but on average, each village in the Doomsday Book, a thousand years ago, had two mills, huge yes. buildings like this. And that would mean that in order to maintain these mills to build them in the first place and then to keep them working because they were grinding and grinding and grinding you'd need a whole lot of proto-engineers people who understood how machinery works who can repair it and build it who can think of better mm -hmm. ways of improving it and so you get from a thousand years ago a civilization beginning to emerge which is based on engineering on the use of uh, non-human power and thinking carefully about how to transform this so that what we think of as the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century is really the, the final effect of something which has started hundreds of years earlier and has led to people thinking deeply about how you can use natural force to help human beings survive in a diffi difficult environment. That's right. So this is really the core. It's no accident, in fact, that this is called a mill and that the first great industrial steam-powered um, buildings were called mills. So all they were was this, plus steam. So that's this, right. this the next stage of the evolution, that. That's right. So this is the first industrial revolution, really, these, these mills. And the second industrial revolution is the one we famously hear about in the steam power. That's right. They would run them with, with steam engines then mm. rather than water. Mm. They could run them whenever they wanted to. They didn't have to rely upon the water or the wind for the, mm. for the windmills. So much more control over it. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. But the great, so this large building um, was traditionally called a mill. One of the interesting connections is that it, obviously it's a huge, complicated machine for turning non-human power into something useful for humans. And the word mill links it directly with the Industrial Revolution, the second Industrial Revolution, because when they brought people together and they applied steam power and used cogs and machines and so on. Of course, they called it mills. Yes. So they were just one stage on evolution from this kind of medieval mill. The, the Romans 
part of our puzzle. They knew perfectly well how to make very good mills like this. They'd invented them. They had all the cogs. They could make vertical, horizontal mills. And yet they took almost no interest in them for about three or four centuries. They went on in the old ways. So what differentiated them from the medieval period? And the answer that's often given by historians is slavery. Mm -hmm. Because until about the fourth century, all you needed to do if you want some grain ground was to send your slaves and do it. But then they abolished slavery, and suddenly people began to think, well, I'm not going to do that. Who's going to do it? So they started to turn to animal, cattle, and having cattle-driven mills. And they used their slaves and prisoners. And that more or less sufficed for them until the collapse of the Roman Empire. But the old technology, this is one of the fascinating things, the old technology remained. And then a new social formation emerged in the 7th, 8th century, which we call feudalism and uh, the medieval period. So they took the old technology, but they didn't have slaves. The, the West had abolished slaves, didn't have enough animals, had a lot of grain to be uh, made into human food, and it began to develop some alternative using water. But then you had the problem that you could now build mills like this, but they were very expensive, a huge investment, a sort of mini industrial plant, and they wouldn't work unless you could get a monopoly over everyone, because if half the population says, well, it's jolly expensive, I mean, medieval millers were notorious for their high charges, I'm not going there, I can undercut the market, I can set up my own private mill in my own home and maybe do my neighbours as well, much less than the lord of the manor. So in order to make this profitable, as in many inventions, you have to get a monopoly, and the manorial system with its tight control managed to do that. So it was a curious intersection of three things a hard grain that needs to go through this process, the abolition of slavery after the end of the Roman Empire, and a manorial system that gives you monopolies of control in a kind of free capitalist way to set up factories in each village, thousands of factories distributed throughout Northwest Europe. And out of that, all that changed the Industrial Revolution in one way was instead of water, bring in steam, carbon energy from the underground instead of the rather restricted supply because of course there isn't enough rain power really to, to keep mills, uh, enough mills going for an industrial revolution of the second kind. So you basically go down into the soil and dig up the coal. That's the only change. The organization, mm -hmm. the mentality, the skills, the cogging were all there. So you just change the power source and you get an industrial uh, revolution. Yes. And another extraordinary an interesting aspect of it is that if you look at this cogging, it brings about a mentality which and uh, an expertise in uh, moving power around and expanding and contracting and shifting the directions of it, which leads into all sorts of other kinds of machinery. One obvious thing is clocks. I mean, it's often thought that the medieval millwrights were the great clock manufacturers. Clocks like ones that were first developed, some of the first ones in this area, in Norfolk and elsewhere, directly came out of the cogging systems of medieval mills. So mills, the control of power, which is what a mill is, and the control of time and information, which is what a clock is, were absolutely linked together. And possibly one of the reasons why China and Japan didn't develop mechanical clocks was they didn't have mechanical mills. Because the, the mentality is very similar, the skills are very similar. The other fascinating effect of this um, whole thing is the way in which what started off as grain, I mean, you're a miller and you deal with grain, and grinding this hard, difficult grain into something that humans can. But by about the 12th century, people were beginning to see, well, if you can do this with grain, if you can get this magical substance water to do your job for you, why not apply it to all the other hard and difficult things in the West? And they really were hard and difficult, and they were very different from things in the East. In the East, if you wanted to build complicated, powerful devices, you had a wonderful substance, bamboo. Mm -hmm. You could make almost anything with bamboo. In the West, you didn't have bamboo. So what do you do? You use iron. But iron is a very difficult material to use. To cut it, to beat it, to, to process it is, is very consuming of energy. So the West couldn't have developed iron as they did without water power, because the idea of beginning to use 
cogs and machines like this to pound and grind grain was then expanded to iron manufacture. And nearly the whole of the iron business of the West depended on water milling. So that was a second use. The third one was that in, in the East, they had from very early on wonderful paper. And this paper was made out of the bark of, of trees. And all you needed to do was to boil it up, spread it on the surface of water, sieve it, and you had this wonderful paper. In the West, when they began to develop paper, which became very important in the 12th, 13th century, there was no way you could do this. You didn't have this paper mulberry. What you had to do was to get bits of cloth and beat and beat and beat and beat them. Now, if you tried to do that by hand, someone going like this, it would have been impossible. It would have been too expensive. The price of labor in the West was too high. So what could you do? You used water power. You used the same, exactly the same principles of a water mill, but apply it to paper, so that the whole paper revolution of the West depended on water power and water mills. And then finally, there's the question of clothing, because in, in the East, you had wonderful silk, or you had hemp, and you can work those things very simply. You don't need to do much with them. In the West, it was colder, and you had the sheep. Now, there's a vital process in the manufacturing of wool into cloth, which is where you have to beat the stuff to get the fibers in the right way. And in order to do that, you need mills of some kind, fulling mills. Mm. And indeed, one medieval historian has written an article called The Industrial Revolution of the 13th Century, where she rightly pointed out some time ago that the first industrial revolution, really, in the textile industry, took place in England particularly in the 13th century, when they took exactly this principle, took this mill, but instead of using it for grain, they used it for pounding cloth so that they could begin to make decent cloth or wool. And that all these different processes then split out so that the technological um, history of the world begins to diverge. In a sense, Asia continues with very hard work, people you know, doing all the grain grinding, all the textile working, everything with their own bodies and their hands. In the, in the West, because the materials are much tougher, because they've got the principle of the, of the mill, because they can't force the family or the slaves to do it, they begin to use these kinds of machinery. And so you begin to get the first industrial revolution, which di differentiates the two parts of Europe and Asia from each other. And the second industrial revolution, where the application of steam is just the final concluding phase of this. So this is one of the keys to how the two parts of Asia, Eurasia, differentiated and how the Industrial Revolution occurred. So one of the keys to the development of milling uh, in all its different branches is that you have very difficult materials to work with. You have hard grains, you have cloth, paper, um, you have iron, and so on. Now, this meant that you began to substitute non-human energy, animals and wind and water. But as you did this and got more efficient at it, the idea began to spread, well, let's, if, if the, so to speak, the machine can take the strain or the animal can take the strain, why should we do it? Mm -hmm. So you began to get a civilization in England particularly and Holland and Northern Europe, which was renowned for being, according to its critics, very lazy. They would rather, the, the people would sit around drinking beer, playing cricket, um, yeah. and having a, a reasonable time. You know, they worked, but compared to the arduous, endless work of most peasant civilizations, where people work from dawn to dusk, the Northwest Europeans seemed to be rather laid back and always um, having quite a lot of time for leisure, eating reasonably well, well clothed, and so on. So you began to get this uh, idea of a kind of lazy civilization, which would, whenever possible, think of an alternative to using their back and their muscles. And this develops more and more. What observers didn't really realize was that the reason for the possibility of the laziness was that there was a, a kind of invisible slave civilization in, in Northwest Europe. But the slaves were not the traditional kind of slaves you'd find in Rome or uh, Greece or whatever. They were machine slaves. They were places like this. And you said that this was a five horsepower. Now, five horsepower is you know, equivalent to 10 or 20 human beings. 
every time a mill like this is working, you've got lots of invisible slaves working for you. Likewise, every time you have a cart horse mm. pulling at a, or whatever, you or windmill or any of these or gunpowder, all these things are invisible slaves. So that by the 18th century, just as the Industrial Revolution was starting, every Englishman had three, four, five invisible slaves in the form of animals and mills working for them. What happened in the Industrial Revolution in that point of view is really that the number of invisible slaves suddenly increased because the carbon energy of coal gave you another five. So each Englishman or Dutch person or whatever had ten invisible slaves. I'm just making up the figures, but mm. there are these large numbers. And what has happened in the modern world now is that in affluent parts of the world we have twenty invisible slaves working for us because we have petrol and all these other um, fuels as well. So the reason why we can stand around and watch television and so on and so on is that there we have turned the old form of human slavery into the domestication of the natural world, animals and then later carbon fuels, and we have a new kind of slavery, but it doesn't cost us anything. No, you Just don't have to feed them. <laughs> you don't have to pay them. Well, that's right, and uh, so we can be yeah. conspicuously lazy. Perhaps your brain will be all right. Oh, yes. <laughs> just see the human muscle. In fact, this is a bit of leather. Some Scotsman invented a device that would do this mechanically in the end of the 18th century, and of course then hundreds of thousands of people were out of work. So David, you know this very well, a flail, yes. which illustrates so well how all technology in the end is an extension of man. Because primitive peoples realized that if they wanted to get um, the grain separated from the husk, they could do it with a stone, and they could just beat it like that, using the forearm and the other part of the arm. But after a while, they must have thought, well, we could get much more leverage if we had an extension of our arm. Why not make it like an arm, with a, a joint or a muscle there, and the forearm there? And so they deve developed the flail, which was used in the West, up till the 19th century, which was just an extended arm, but giving you much more power so that you could beat. I mean, this is four times or six times as much as I could do with my short arm, much okay. less tiring. That's great. So, David, this was made of chestnut, probably, because they didn't have oak in this area. And the moment this is all made of, a lot of this is made of iron, but would it have originally, in the medieval period, been made of iron or? It would have been made of wood. It's not until they found ways of casting the metals that uh, they were put in. I see. So th at the moment this is actually wood there. The pit wheel is, is metal, yep. but we use wooden teeth. Mm. It's usually wood into metal to reduce the risk of sparking and um, to prevent fire. So a theory which I once had, which was that the West could make mills like this because they had iron working uh, and the rest of the world, the iron working was different, isn't probably true because this was originally all made of wood, so anyone could have made it if they so wanted anywhere in the world. Made if they, have, wood. If they had the technology mm. and the, the labour. And the hard wood. In theory, and the <laughs> hard wood. Of course, they didn't all have the hard woods. No, that's another limitation. There are many factors in these mm. mills the mm. wind, the water, and the, and the wood. Exactly, everything's got to come together. Yeah. And exactly. then, the, then, of course, the castings, metal yeah. castings. So it's one of those many situations where everything has to, got to come together. Yes.
Ready?